Hello, everybody. Welcome to our COVID panel discussion here on October 6th. Uh, my name is Lenore Swiston, and I'm here with my colleague, Anika Misha, and we are co-hosting uh, tonight's important discussion on kind of the state of COVID-19 in our community of Saskatoon and wider community of Saskatchewan. So good evening. We want to begin by acknowledging we're here on Treaty 6 lands and the traditional lands of the Métis, Dakota, Lakota, and so too. Um, and uh, we are here with also our colleagues Ian Roach and Deborah Hubrick of No YXE who are in the back end of this today along with us. And we are all committed here to offering you local community content through streaming channels and media just like this and community radio. So thanks for tuning in. Anika, over to you. Thanks, Lenore. So we would now like to welcome our panel members. First, we have Dr. Hassan Masri, critical care physician and associate professor of medicine and critical care at the University of Saskatchewan. And we have Jean Morrison, president and CEO of Emmanuel Healthcare and president and CAO of St. Paul's Hospital and a nurse by profession. And then we have Pamela Golden McLeod, director of emergency planning with the city of Saskatoon. We have Dr. Dennis Kendall, retired physician former registrar of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Saskatchewan and current healthcare consultant. And we have Dr. Nazim Muhajirin, professor and chair of community health and epidemiology with the University of Saskatchewan. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for taking the time out to join us. I, I know you guys have a busy schedule, so thank you so much. Over to you, Lenore. Yeah, thank you so much. So as we've done with previous show, this forum will be conducted in essentially three key parts. First, we're going to ask some questions of each of the panel members. Second, as time provides, we're going to open this up to the floor for any of you as the viewing audience. And you can also be part of this through Facebook and Twitter at a hashtag called COVID19YXE, which we'll have Deb and Ian put up in the back channel here. And three, we're gonna give our panel members some time at the end to reflect on any closing marks they have. I know we're getting a little bit of back channel noise right now, so I hope that we'll be altering some of that here soon. Um, and I just wanna thank our fellow uh, panel members and audience member for joining tonight's show. Uh, we're always working out the glitches on these formats. We're using StreamYard for this. So thanks, thanks for uh, coming in on that. And please look to, to sharing the views of this afterwards on your various channels through Voice of Saskatoon, Civically Speaking, and any of our panel members. So back to you, Anika. Perfect, thank you, Lenore. So yeah, as Lenore mentioned, feel free to, um, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, feel free to put that down there and we'll be more than happy to address that um, near the end of the show. So my first question is, um, we'll start with Dr. Muhajirin. Over the next two to three minutes, please share your perspective and experience regarding the current situation around COVID-19 in our city and province as a whole and beyond. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope people can hear me okay. And, um, and I just want to start with uh, saying good evening and, 
and also um, just uh, thanking and congratulating the organizers of this event. It's really important to uh, take a, a bit of a moment to, to have these kinds of conversations. Um, so, Anika, I mean, I, I'm going to actually say a few things uh, just to get the conversation going. I'm looking forward to more of a conversation, answering questions from, uh, uh, from viewers. When I think about uh, where we are right now, both in the city as well as in the province, but particularly in the city of Saskatoon, I see a dissonance. Uh, I see a dissonance in the sense that on the one hand, we have just had the worst month uh, coming out of September with regard to COVID in this city, in this province. I don't think I need to really go over the, the statistics really right now, uh, right now. I mean, it is very well known. I think the healthcare system has been absolutely under stress. This is what a healthcare system under stress, pushed to the brink, looks like. Um, vaccine uptake has slowed to a crawl, although there has been a little bit of an uptick in the past two weeks or so. Uh, there's a long way to go to that herd immunity, even if we could get there. And, uh, and about um, uh, school reopened uh, in, sept in, in September with no overall government mandate public health policy regime or protocols in place. So that is on the one hand. On the other hand, when you go outside, when I go outside in our community, there seems to be a palpable lack of urgency. And I, I, and I say this bec because I, I do go out there. I mean, I was uh, on Broadway, you know, doing the uh, Broadway street fair, almost even a complacency and, a, and, and maybe a fatigue among people in our community. Uh, so on the one hand, I see healthcare system under tremendous duress. We are having one of the worst experiences since the pandemic arrived here, uh, you know, right now and, and, and in September. But on the other hand, people seem to be uh, just going about their business, you know. So I, I kind of uh, note that as a, almost like a bit of a sociological observation. Um, last, the other point I'll just make and then uh, I'll pass it on. I think this could be a reflection of our political leadership. In fact, a lack of political leadership. And, uh, and it could also be how us prairie folks handle a pandemic. Uh, and, you know, so we can get into more of that a little bit later, but uh, those are a couple of things that I'd, I would offer uh, right off the bat here. So opening, uh, opening offering. Thank you so much and very well said. Um, we'll go to next, Jean Morrison, please. Oh, you're muted, so. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight with everyone and I'm to be with an esteemed crowd who have all kinds of knowledge I hope to contribute. But um, I have the good fortune to actually uh, visit facilities all over the province and work every day, talk to people from hospitals and long-term care settings across the province. And I would say, you know, not different than what we heard from many others, that the hospitals are maxed out. And certainly the city hospitals are maxed out, but even in the rural areas, those hospitals are seeing unprecedented amount of, of work coming and going from their facilities. And the beds are full and people are very sick. We don't have people in beds who aren't sick. Nearly all healthcare facilities in the province have significant staffing challenges. When someone calls in sick, there is no one to replace them most times. It's very infrequent we can find someone. And when people are putting up postings to fill positions, you hope to have qualified applicants. The staff and physicians are tired. They've been really running for over a year and a half now. It's been like an uphill marathon where people are learning, adjusting and responding day after day. And you can't run people continually in overdrive for 18 months without negative consequences. Um, we don't run machines continually without having stoppages for maintenance and, and things. And you certainly don't do it in overdrive 24 seven for 18 months. And frankly, that's how the system has been running. People are wearing out, there's lots of emotion, people are burning out, and people are leaving the system. And I just, you know, to what Nassim had said earlier about 
when you're out and about, if I think about last year, you know, people were really wary going out. People aren't wary anymore. I'm surprised every time I'm out to see how many people are out. And I would even say, you know, in the cities, people keep their distance at stores pretty well. You see many people wearing masks. You don't see that all over the province all the time, though. It is it is different. We have different cultures in different locations, and you see vast differences across the province. Thank you so much for sharing your comments. And um, next, I'll go to Dr. Masri. Oops. Um, you're muted. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to join everyone uh, this evening. You would think after a year and a half of uh, using Zoom and uh, all these things, I would remember to unmute myself before I start speaking. Uh, but uh, that pandemic uh, of unmuting myself is not over anytime soon. Um, you know, the, the, this last month and the current wave has really tested um, the healthcare system, has tested the spirits of the healthcare workers, have also tested the spirits of our citizens in Saskatoon and Saskatchewan. You know, I could speak uh, with relative authority, you being in the hospital and in, in ICU, that our ICUs are not beyond capacity. They are almost beyond surge capacity, which just so everyone understand what that means. It means when we have our regular capacity, then we almost doubled our capacity. And when you double your capacity, you don't double it in a regular way. You don't, ha you don't have a way to create staff. So you're using staff that usually doesn't work in the ICU or on the regular floor. And beyond the fact that the ICU is full, we have people who are on the regular floor uh, in the hospital who, if it was 2019, they would not be on the floor, they would be in the ICU. There are real consequences to that. But the problem is when you have something going on for 18 months, people get really tired, including all of us, uh, speakers and listeners, we get tired of even talking about statistics. And fortunately, COVID doesn't get tired. And what we're seeing here is that in the first wave and the second wave and the third wave, there was a direct impact to people who got COVID. And then there was a significant financial impact to some of the businesses outside of the hospital. But what makes the fourth wave extremely frustrating and dangerous is that the impact is actually being felt by everyone. Just over the last two weeks, we have had to impact 3,000 families in Saskatchewan by canceling their surgeries and procedures. Surgeries and procedures that may either save their life in the next few weeks, months, or improve their lifestyle over the next many months. So this is really, really serious. And it's, it's tough to say to people it's serious when we have been saying that for a long time. So now people are like, well, how serious is this? And it gets diluted in the message. But it's not all doom and gloom. Over the last three weeks, what we have seen is that people, whether because of the mandates of the government, which finally did some action, we have seen that the vaccination rates have doubled and tripled in certain weeks. And that tells you that the role in a, in a, in a, in a society like ours, there is a role for physicians, there is a role for government, there is a role for media, there is a role for everyone. And I think that if we collectively as a society understand the consequences of inaction, um, and that it is not going to escape anyone. You know, I'll, I'll finish with this. One of the very famous stories in, in, uh, in our culture that I, I love to always reflect upon is that we are currently in the fourth wave riding a boat with a big hole in that boat and the unvaccinated are in the bottom floor of the, of the boat and the vaccinated are in the second floor of the, in the boat. And if the vaccinated people don't act fast enough not only the unvaccinated will drown but everyone will drown so we have a responsibility to understand that in order to thrive as a society we really really need to plug that hole and save everyone including ourselves thank you dr masri and very well said um over to you pamela 
Okay, I have to find my mute button because we have this deal going that if we start speaking without unmuting in my workplace, we owe $2 to a charity. So at this point, I'm turning over almost my whole salary. <laughs> um, you know, I share, I'm going to speak from, you know, everybody else on the panel has a connection to health and I, and I don't. So I'm speaking more from, you know, the planning side, from that side outside of health and how this is impacting us. And I will say we are exhausted too. Um, nobody is meant to have you know, this type of adrenaline need to be responding all the time for 18 months, two years. And it, it has been hard. I would say the last month I've been involved with more meetings where people are in tears and look exhausted and are struggling and people who care passionately and deeply and, and want to keep things going. One of the things, um, one of the things that we tried to do at the city is we brought in a framework for our response and we looked at um, you know indicators and we worked with our, our health partners and epidemiologists and the university and came up with some indicators and came up with a framework for measures based on those indicators and one of the reasons we really need to do that is because you know our staff were you know feeling like they've got no control over their lives they've got no control over what's happening at work you know things changed constantly mask wear a mask don't wear a mask change you're now in close contact so you have to wear this type of ppe and in the community as well you know what's going on with our civic centers what's going on here what's going on there and so we really wanted to bring in something that would give people the indication of here's what's going to happen you've got some feeling of control over your life some feeling of control and also if we all work hard together here's the level we'll get to and what that will mean for us and, you know, I think that's one of the things is everybody's exhausted, but everybody's anxious about things and needs to have some, some sense of control over their lives again. Um, you know, beyond the health impacts, you know, we've had businesses and services that are critical that have been trying to plan and ensure that they're, they've got good business continuity plans and they've got a good emergency response plans and that they have plans in place for if their staff members get, get COVID and how they respond. Um, you know, when you look at the deaths that have occurred, those deaths are people in our community who work in our community, who have relationships in our community. And when you look at 10 deaths a day and five deaths a day and eight deaths a day, those are families and communities that are impacted deeply and workplaces impacted deeply, repeatedly in the last little while. And so I think that's something to realize is that um, I, wish, I wish we honored deaths differently in the announcements. And I wish that we acknowledge the impact on our community of those deaths. So I think, you know, Dr. Mark Fenton spoke to city council last week. And at the end of his presentation, we were all thanking him and saying, please thank the health workers that you work with. And he pointed out that there's 4,500 Saskatchewan Health Authority staff members in Saskatoon. He can't talk to each one of them. The best way for us to thank them is by doing something, by making changes, by having overt actions that will lessen the impact. And so that was the challenge he laid to us and that's how we're we're trying to proceed thank you so much pamela and last but not least dr kendall thank you so i'm going to uh, speak at a more macro level about policy uh, decision making in the midst of a pandemic um, there is a concept when dealing with life-threatening circumstances that time is of the essence and um, what we have generally observed, uh, both globally and across our nation, is that public leaders who responded quite quickly and decisively to the threat of the pandemic uh, got better outcomes than those who waited longer until things were more out of control. And similarly, if you withdraw the protections too early, then the virus is opportunistic, so it'll seize the opportunity to spread more aggressively. In our society, in a federation like Canada, we have a division of powers between the federal government and the provincial government, and then we have division of powers between municipal governments and our provincial government. And, uh, in the health sector, a very large proportion of the decision making is vested with provincial governments. They are given the responsibility and authority to make decisions. And regrettably, our provincial government has been among the ones that has been slow to act 
when we first were threatened and too quick to uh, draw back controls on July 11th. And consequently, we in Alberta are faring the worst in this country at the moment with very tragic impact. Each day when I see the number of deaths, uh, I agree with uh, Pamela that we, we, we don't rightly mourn what's happening. It's just a number on a screen, but actually each day when there's 10 deaths or today seven deaths, it's seven families ripped apart uh, in terms of uh, their lives. So I would plead with our provincial government to step up to the plate and become more proactive and to cooperate more with municipal governments and with other agencies rather than uh, um, in some cases uh, denying the requests of municipal governments as we've recently seen the city of Saskatoon has asked our government to act and it's declined to do so. I just want to comment also in terms of the education, the, the public education system of our children, uh, it would have been infinitely better to have pan-provincial policies rather than punting these to the school divisions. The school divisions vary enormously in terms of their uh, available expertise, and it's very difficult for some of them to actually make well-informed decisions. And so uh, even though it's late in the day, I wish our provincial government would actually pull that back into its own domain and institute more uniform policies to protect children across the province. I will say that uh, it has been uh, it has been frustrating as a citizen to feel at times that economic interests are put ahead of human lives. But I think one of the things I'm beginning to hear now from people is that uh, when people complain, for instance, about the vaccine mandate and the necessity to show proof of vaccination to go into some businesses. And there was a list of businesses that uh, so-called freedom list that expressed opposition to this. Some of them weren't even impacted by it, but they expressed opposition. I want to say to people in the business community, there's a market. And 70% of the people in this country, in this province, want more rigorous controls. And so if you think you're going to cater to the 30%, you may be headed for bankruptcy sooner than you think. I think you need to pay attention to the overwhelming majority of citizens who want to be protected. And they will honor businesses that do that. I know more and more of my friends who are making conscious decisions to switch where they do business because a business that they thought respected their well-being has shown otherwise, so they're walking away and they're going to competitors. So uh, markets have a way of speaking, and I think the markets will speak, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing your perspective and comments. And thank you everyone who's tuning in to different channels. And please feel free to share any questions, feedbacks, comments you have. And we'll be more than happy to take um, any questions and comments um, near the end. And over to you, Lenore. Yeah, thank you so much. Really, uh, you've got me leaning in and learning in. And I, that's always good. So, you know, this is a topic that, you know, as, as all of you as panel members have been saying, it's been around now for, you know, 19 months. And so in those 19 months, there's been all kinds of learnings, disinformation, misinformation, all this sort of stuff. And we've got questions all queued up for you on that. This next question, though, I want to focus in on just, and you've already touched on this. And, you know, Dr. Kendall, you know, I might come right back to you to lead this off. So I might break my own rule here on order uh, because I want you to start this off because you've been really public about this. You just spoke about you know, what is it important for the public to understand going forward, especially in light of what we hear from all of the different leaderships that are out there, whether it's at a provincial basis or other, how do we sift through that to understand what's important for the public to know going forward? 
digging deep into that because it is very, very confusing as a public member, as you said, as a resident, as a citizen, to kind of understand how to navigate this. You know, as somebody who is, is watching this every day and communicating every day, what are some of the things that we need to know as a public? So Dr. Kendall, starting with you. Sure, well, first of all, I think you have to make a reasonable decision about who are the most trusted sources of information. And of course, the, you know, the, the media, the, or the social media channels are rife with all sorts of misinformation and, and uh, often people, you know, get sucked down rabbit holes following some of that. Um, I just want to share an observation that uh, at a recent press conference, Premier Mo said that uh, healthcare professionals should answer the bell, was the words he used, and engage in public education about COVID. And in actual fact, a diverse array of healthcare professionals have been doing our best to do that right from the beginning. What I would say back to Premier Mo is back on August 26th, when all of the medical health officers jointly issued a three page recommendation in our statement with recommendations over the signature of Corey Newdorf, uh, perhaps you should have listened and respected that considered opinion, because quite frankly, um, if you aren't willing to listen to the voices of people who have devoted their careers to this, then I think you're, you're missing the boat. And uh, again, I would urge all citizens to pay more attention to people who actually are evidence-based in their recommendations as opposed to uh, some of the stuff that you will find online. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kendall, for that. You know, over now to, um, you know, Nazim. I always call you Nazim. Um, so, but, I mean, you're a doctor of epidemiology. You have been a point person on this for a very long time, and I just want to thank you for the service that you provided because you have been doing a, a lot of that public education on this, and, and, and you've touched on it. But, you know, how important is it for the public to know this? Because, there, you know, you can hear the urgency in my voice as somebody who's trying to help kind of move this along with evidence base. But where do we go with this? You know, Leno, I think I want to uh, talk about public health, you know, public in the public health. And uh, um, public health is uh, fundamentally about our society, our, our government, uh, our country organizing itself to provide for our people you know, its citizens uh, through laws, policies, uh, in order to protect, to prevent, to monitor, and to respond to uh, circumstances like we are finding ourselves in right now, COVID-19. Uh, there's such a successful history of public health, you know. Um, when public health uh, does its work, does its magic, we don't see it uh, because we are preventing things from happening you know, before it happens. Uh, and, and what we have seen uh, in, during this pandemic, particularly in this province, in our province, is that, um, that public health has been hamstrung, has been, has been um, limited you know, by the political leadership. And I, I think I just want to say that, I should have said that in the first go around. Uh, and this is why we keep coming to the political leadership and the political environment, uh, because without the political environment and political leadership, there's no public health. I just want to make that absolutely clear because if I don't make that clear, I'll be not doing my public health work right here you yeah. know, at this moment. There are three things I think the public need to do, I think, moving forward. Vigilance, we have to uh, make sure that, uh, that we know who we uh, gather with, uh, who we socialize with. Uh, these are very practical issues, you know, that's what I'm talking about. And and where we go, you know, the places we go and the environments that we go into and so on. So we had we had to be very vigilant uh, about who we uh, who, who we socialize with and uh, and and where we go. The second point is about normalizing conversations about vaccines. Unfortunately, you know, since about 1980s or so, I mean, uh, an article that was later retracted uh, that that connected uh, vaccines with autism, 
<laughs> you know, gave rise to vaccine hesitancy, vaccine refusal. So actually, when we talk about that continuum of vaccine hesitancy to outright refusal based, based on ideology almost, you know, this is not a new thing. You know, it has been amped up during, you know, during this pandemic, but it is not a new thing at all. And what we have to do is one way to counter that is to talk among ourselves what vaccines are about. You know, I want to, I need to tell people that I'm vaccinated and I need to be able to ask people, you know, whether they're vaccinated, normalize a conversation about vaccination. I think that is the best way to uh, combat, I think, you know, vaccine hesitancy and vaccine uh, refusal. Um, just what the third thing I would say, again, very practical thing uh, and, and associated with vaccines. We will have vaccines available to children. Um, perhaps starting with two years of age uh, to learn uh, sooner rather than later. It's not going to take us uh, one year. I mean, maybe three months, maybe four months. And, uh, and I would expect more of a pushback from parents. If history, if precedents was to teach us something, we will see more vaccine hesitancy with regard to children getting vaccinated uh, than we have seen adults getting vaccinated. We need our children vaccinated. So mm -hmm. I think we need to have those conversations now. We need to have our parents asking questions if they have questions and doubts, and we need to be able to answer them you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a gentle manner and a, in, a, in, a, in a manner that doesn't uh, you know, put them on, you know, get their backs up, <laughs> put them on the defensive, you know, and I think we need to do that as, as professionals, as public health professionals, as medical professionals, and, and so on. So vigilance, uh, normalizing vaccine conversation, mm -hmm. and anticipating kids getting vaccinated. We need our parents, our school division uh, heads, leadership, uh, to begin to talk about, uh, you know, vaccine, getting vaccines to our kids arms uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah, thank you so much. And that is, that's very helpful, practical guidance. So I appreciate that, Dr. Majorin, because that's, that's the kind of stuff that we need to know as the public, right? Because, of, you know, trying to sift through everything, I trust you, you're local, you know, we, can, we will meet you in the grocery store, you know, at some point, safely, by the way. So those are all good things. So Dr. Mazri, over to you. I know you always got wisdom coming from, from the perspective that you are there right in, right in the front lines, where, you know, seeing people with this. What's, what's the message to the public that's important going forward with this? Oops, I think he owes two dollars, Pamela, to your account. Like probably two thousand at this point. <laughs> I think one of the most important things that um, I, that, that we need to talk about is the importance of facts, and is the importance of being accurate and scientific. Mm -hmm. One of the mm -hmm. things that we have noticed throughout this pandemic is that facts uh, have lost their importance. So uh, in, a, in a scientific debate, uh, the only way to win your way is by presenting stronger facts, uh, better facts, more uh, substantial facts, more studied facts, and not just simply stating an opinion um, or memorized lines from a YouTube video. So I think what we really need to, what is really important for the public to understand is we need to go back to facts, right? I cannot tell you in December, on December 20th, that it's 32 degrees because I feel like saying that. It has to be 32 degrees outside for me to say that it's 32 degrees. And currently, um, that doesn't matter. I could just say it's 32 degrees. And if I say to you, actually, according to the thermostat, it is, as you all will, will, will soon feel it, it'll be probably minus 30. Uh, hopefully not. You say to me, well, you're just a follower and you're not using your brain and you're just following those uh, 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 people on the weather channel. And so I think it's really important to, because a lot of the struggle that we're having here is a struggle with facts and, and, the people, and, the, and that people are not talking about facts anymore. The second uh, important message, and this seems to be a really problematic message in Alberta and Saskatchewan, particularly. 
we're all for the economy and the economy is important, but at no point I'm willing to ever equate the economy with the lives of the human beings. So that's just that, that to me is a no starter. And the public needs to understand, is the economy more important than the lives of the people in Saskatchewan? But even if for the sake of argument, we assume that they are equal, what we know for sure from the nations and places where the economy was put ahead of the lives of the people, both did not survive. Not the people and not the economy. You cannot run an economy at all where people are afraid to go and have dinner. You cannot run an economy where people are afraid to go and travel and spend their money. You cannot run an economy where every day at the school, at your business, at whatever it is, five people are calling sick or isolating. You cannot run an economy where uh, people are literally dying and unhealthy and, and they're not well. So even if you were to take this slogan of open for summer and, and, and you know, economy and we don't want, even if you were to take that, the best way to get this economy going is to have an 87, 89, 90% vaccination rates because the economy will be healthier, just like the people. The final point that I think is, um, you know, extremely um, important to talk about when it comes to what to expect. There seem to be, and this is, uh, and, and I, um, I, maybe it is my fatigue as this, uh, as this uh, pandemic goes, but um, I am losing some of my filters. So I will go straight to the point. It would appear to be that the Honorable Premier Scott Moe has put in the minds of the people that public health measures are punishments. And there are many people that look at this as such. Oh, I can't believe I have to mask or I cannot believe that I cannot mix with 30 people indoor in a poorly ventilated area because it has come to our mind over time that if you do not behave, we will put public health measures. The reality is public health measures are some of the oldest things that we have in, you know, had in this nation for a long time. A very popular public health measure is limiting alcohol level in your system before driving. A very famous public health measure is making sure that kids have a specific seat to sit on. Nobody thinks of a child seat as a punishment for their two-year-old. In fact, people will raise their eyebrows if they heard that you are rebelling against that. Public health measures are not punishments. And we need to understand that. We need to understand that it's not because I failed, now I cannot drink and drive, or now I have to wear my mask. I wear my mask because I'm an outstanding citizen who cares about the safety of others and obviously myself. I think this is really, really important. My discussions with a lot of people would suggest that there is a deep misunderstanding of public health measures and people look at it as sign of failures or a punishment. We really need to change that paradigm. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Majri. That was a very good answer that builds on Dr. Majri's um, responses as well. So we've got some good learnings here. Pamela, you know, you're with the city of Saskatoon. You're with the emergency response kind of unit and emergency services and such. Um, and, and, and here we are, right? So building on this, what are some thoughts that you have that's important for us to know in our city of Saskatoon? And for that matter, transferring that to any other municipality out there? Well, there's a couple things I thought about when I saw this question. And the first one is, um, I'm very concerned about the number of children who are getting COVID. And I'm concerned about their health, I'm concerned about their well-being. But what concerns me, I think has been referenced, is the impact on the economy and the impact on critical services. When a child under 12 has to self-isolate for 10 days and has COVID or 12 days um, and is ill, they need a parent staying home with them. And so I think, I think it's very easy to sometimes downplay um, COVID in children and talk about how it doesn't have as deep of impact. And I'll look at our medical experts to you know, provide feedback on that. 
But from a critical infrastructure point of view, there's a deep impact when that many children have COVID on our community and on our province. And the impact is in the workforce, the impact is in productivity, the impact is in services. And so I think sometimes, I think it's really, really important that we focus on the health outcomes and the impact on the health, health industry, sorry, health um, field. But I think sometimes we minimize the impact on the rest of the community with with COVID and the and the way the rest of the community has to be prepared for that. And from an emergency management point of view, I'm still telling all of our sectors, is your business continuity plan up to date? Is your emergency response plan up to date? Mm -hmm. What's your plan for a traumatic response if you have a staff member die of COVID? What are your plans in place for supporting your staff after that happens? And so I think the focus on health is very important, but there are so many cascading impacts that we're not talking about on a regular basis. And I think we have to start talking about those as well, because we've made it an either or situation and it's not. Um, and I think we all have to think about things differently and start thinking about how are we preparing ourselves. Um, Dr. Mahaj talked about, you know, those hard conversations. And that's the other big thing for me now is, are you having those hard, courageous conversations with your family members? If you've got children under 12, are you having a hard conversation with their uncle who refuses to get vaccinated to the risk he's putting those children at? And I think these are conversations we need to get comfortable having. And if we have real, honest, open relationships with the people we love, we can have those conversations. We should not be scared of having those conversations with the people in our lives. They are critical conversations and they're critical conversations with our, with our coworkers and with our friends. And I think now is the time for us to think about what's our priority. Is our, if you have a child under 12, how do you prioritize their safety and well-being? And what are you doing differently about that than you were a little while ago? And so I think it's time for hard conversations and it's time for our business sector and our municipalities to start thinking about our plans for when COVID starts to impact us in a different way. Because when you have an employee die of COVID, which we are seeing, you know, when you look at the rates we're seeing right now, there's going to be no sector untouched. There's probably going to be no business untouched by that. What is your plans to support your employees after that happens? And what is that going to look like? Yeah, thank you so much, Pamela. I really, really appreciate that. Some really great building by panel members, and I'm really appreciating the viewers that have tuned in. Please do share this amongst your network right now. Chat it up and use this as part of the discussions that you're having with family and friends and that. We know that this is a hot button issue. People have very, very strong opinions on this. And, you know, what we're trying to get the message through is get this based in fact, grounded in the evidence and go to good legitimate sources of which you have on the screen right now before us. Jane Morrison, you know, you are the president and CEO of a number of things that come under the umbrella of Emanuel Health. And so when you look at that, that includes St. Paul's Hospital. And so when we think about this in terms of some of the things that you're having to message out to the public, please share some of the thoughts that you have on this. And I also want to, you know, share with people too, your background is in nursing. Uh, so you come by the front lines naturally and know this from right from the front lines all the way to the back lines and all that stuff we don't see. So uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to share right now. I think we might have a little delay here. Oh, we six dollars. Yes. Um, when I think about some of the conversations that I've had with people over the last two to three weeks, because I do come from a healthcare background, you know, I was grounded in public health, and I really have had a lot of conversations with people about conscientious objection and what is it. And reminding myself about that because people mm -hmm. do have a right to make a decision about whether to vaccinate or not in our province right now. I think with that, we have to remember that with that comes responsibilities and it's that responsibility to be a, an honorable and contributing part to your community to protect the rest of the community and to work to make sure they're safe. And, you know, it's, and with that, um, Dr. Masri talked about sharing that information with people and sharing facts with them and better facts. But we also have to listen because we shut down people right away if we come on too fast, too forcefully. People can't hear us. 
So how do we keep those conversations uh, civil and keep the lines open? Because the vast, there are some people on the fringes who it, they're not going to listen to anything anyone says, but there's a lot of people who are waiting in a, in a different spot for a variety of reasons, including fear, including just never got around to it. How do we share with them in a way that they can hear it from us? And I think personal stories help a lot. Um, I said to someone last week, I said, you know, I hear what you're telling me, but I also know what I have learned through my study and reading I do. And I also lived with an aunt and a cousin who both had polio and suffered the chronic disease consequences of polio the rest of their life. And if we can stop that, I think that's the sad part. We don't know what that aftershock is going to be yet. And if people knew now what that would be, it might change a lot of decisions. So how do we have those discussions and get people opening that thought process a bit, little bit more? Because that's what really scares me, not only for myself, but for my grandchildren, is what happens to them in 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 years. People might hear that a little bit more. Yeah, thank you so much, Jean, for that response. And thanks to all the panel members for your thoughtful responses to this uh, second round of questions. Anika, you're going to start us off on this third round by going to some of the audience members in terms of questions there. So take it away, Anika. Yeah, thanks, Lenore. And thank you, everyone, for uh, your answers. Um, we're learning a lot. And thanks for sharing your very valuable feedbacks and perspectives. So the first question that I'm going to be taking from the audience is from Iris. Orisia, and she's asking, insofar as Delta variant, it remains the dominant threat and of course needs to be under control. But I'm wondering if there is any good news worldwide in terms of future virulent variants developing. Is Delta the last worst threat of COVID? And by random order, I'll start with Dr. Masri. Um. So it will not be the last. Uh, let me start with the bad news and then I'll go to the good news. Um, you know, bacteria and viruses, uh, what they always do and what they will always do is try to outsmart us. Um, and we have an option here is to either allow them to outsmart us at a very rapid pace or to not allow them to outsmart us at a rapid pace. So it is not something that we have no control over. Uh, now, on to the good news is that in nations, for example, Portugal, where the vaccination rates are incredibly high um, in the high 80s and beyond even in some cities in Portugal, the public health measures that we have instituted and many other things have been uh, uh, taken down quite a bit and social life and economy is thriving um, much, much better. And so... It is not the last mutation for this virus. This virus will continue to mutate for the next 100 years and will likely outlive us. Of course, unless we get to close to 100% vaccination rates, then we may actually um, not provide enough growth for it that it may just sort of um, stop mutating or slow down to an incredible point. But as long as we provide the fertilizer and the water and the sun for it to mutate, by not getting our vaccine, uh, then certainly we'll see uh, more mutations. I mean, the reason why we are here where we are uh, and having a Delta wave uh, and, 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 and the Delta variant is because initially uh, in the initial COVID and then <clears throat> the British variant um, and the Indian variant and the South African variant and the Brazilian variant, which all sound historic, sounds like I am now taking you to 1860, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it was a few months ago. Um, the reason why we are here is because there was a huge amount of spread and no vaccine available, period. But the real test for humanity and for, for, for citizens is do we really need to have more virulent and more terrible uh, variants or are we going to stop this and slow it down significantly um, with the vaccines that we have? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Masri. And I guess I'll open this up to the panel members. Does anyone else want to take the question and answer it? 
I, I think uh, Hassan actually re provided a very good answer. I mean, the only thing that I will sort of add is that, and and I am adding what I what I'm going to say here, uh, from a perspective of just earlier today, early this afternoon, I was part. Uh, I was on a conversation uh, with the National um, Research Network, uh, Coronavirus Variants Rapid Research Network, CoANet. Uh, and I'm a, I'm one of the uh, lead members in that uh, in that network, and we were listening to some of our colleagues talk about uh, this very question about uh, variants of concern, variants of interest emerging in the in the in the in the future. I think um, that uh, Delta is is different. It's a it's a different beast. It's a different variant than all of the previous four or five VOCs uh, variants of concern. Uh, but I think we, 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 if we get enough people vaccinated, not only in Canada, but globally, I, I think that is important. You know, where there is vaccine inequity, you know, somewhere in this planet, you know, there are a lot of people who are not vaccinated, you know, where uh, this variant or a future variant, you know, can take hold you know, can and can spread, then that actually threatens all the whole planet. That threatens not only that community, that country, it threatens us here in Canada, that threatens us here in Saskatchewan, Saskatoon. So it's really important for us to look beyond the borders of Saskatchewan and Canada, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and it's an important, uh, <laughs> important message to, you know, to, to leave, uh, leave behind. I... I think that um, I think human beings have survived millionaire because we have outsmarted all of the <laughs> all of the pathogens, you know. And I I trust I trust I I would bet on our on, on human beings, you know. Yes, you know, we we could do more. We need to do more, and that is the whole point of, of tonight's conversation. But think about how quickly vaccines were developed unprecedented i mean mm -hmm. if somebody would have said mm -hmm. you know last september or last march we will be vaccinating people starting december 14th mm -hmm. you know 2020 they would they would scoff at you they will you know mm -hmm. laugh at you but i think i think human ingenuity you know will actually keep the virus at bay i want mm -hmm. to say that because i think we can use some hopeful <laughs> hopeful mm -hmm. signs mm -hmm. and messages as well uh, we need to do everything we can, and uh, and I think I think we will, uh, even though new variants will emerge, uh, in order for to keep new variants from not emerging, one thing we need to do is we need to make sure that it doesn't spread. I mean, I think people need to understand that with each new case, with each new case, there's a possibility for mutations to adapt to you know the host better mm -hmm. you know and and i think that's important that's why we say cut it off from the point of infection not at point of hospitalization or, or preventing deaths mm -hmm. cut it off right from the point of infection that is how we are going to get ahead of any any variants from emerging and and really uh, threatening in the future as well thank you so much um does anyone else want to take this question Okay. Well, I, I just want to say that I, I, I think in terms of public education, you know, I, I hear people often asking questions like, will this become like the seasonal flu, you know, influenza, mm -hmm. which uh, each year, you know, vaccines are prepared based on the evolving uh, uh, nature of, of, of that organism. And, and then we go and get shots. And so I, I think there's going to be a lot of public education necessary as we move forward to understand how we ought to most intelligently respond to new variants. And, and already our colleagues have mentioned, uh, you know, trying the best to limit spread as quickly as possible is, is just always the best strategy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I'll pass it over to Lenore. 
Yeah, so a couple more technical questions before we go kind of back to a, ma to a macro perspective. So thanks to, to audience members that are uh, that are firing out some questions right now. Here's one, just in terms of, and and I know Dr. Majorian, you've 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 spoken to this at some at some points, kind of when you've we've shared with the media. But to anyone on the panel here, do you feel at some point? that a lockdown of some sort may still be in our best interest. That comes from Bobby Don. So thanks, Bobby Don, for sending this. But just curious is like, are we at that stage? We've got the highest numbers of hospitalizations right now. Dr. Masri has informed us. So just like we're right at that scene level there right now. Like, is there any merit to thinking about that? And I know there are some, even in the media, some of the pundits out there that play on this in terms of, oh, this is just hysterics when we start talking about other men measures other than vaccines. But I'm hearing from this panel of experts that that's not just about vaccines, it's about all sorts of things. So where do lockdowns fit in right now? Uh, Leno, this is not a trick question, is it? No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> <I'm> not at <laughs> all. <laughs> I think Dr. Masri's uh, comment, I want to actually kind of lift it up again. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is, um, it is really well put, right? I mean, that mm -hmm. somehow from our political leaders, we have come to understand, and I'm using the royal we here, uh, we have come to understand that somehow um, putting public health measures in place, reintroducing public health measures when it is needed and quickly, exactly. Uh, is a punishment. <laughs> it's somehow for not being, mm -hmm. you know, good people, good citizens, you know. And and so I want to kind of start with that in answering this question. I have resisted in calling uh, uh, for a lockdown or stay, you know, stay at home order. Um, but the time may be, you know, the time may be now for a short break you know, in, in, in our activities, a, a short, maybe a stay at home, you know, it has to be done very quickly and it has to be done very sharply. And maybe it may, may even have to be done on a regional basis, mm -hmm. you know, and I think all of this needs to be taken into consideration 19 months into the pandemic. I think that if this was happening uh, back in a year ago, you know, in 2020, we would be probably all of us, many of us would be calling for, you know, stay at home orders and lockdowns. But mm -hmm. we are at the 19th month of the pandemic. You know, we have been at this for a long time. And then to be, to be thinking about a lockdown, a whole scale, you know, lockdown, it's, it's just so unpalatable, <laughs> yeah. you know, in some ways. I, I speak as a public health, you know, person. It's so unpalatable, you know. But how, how do we, how, what, what else do we do? I think we can do so many different things, so, so much more. We need to have restrictions and limitations on public gathering. That's mm -hmm. a measure to put in place, you know, than actually stay at home or lockdown. We need to make sure that proof of, uh, proof of vaccination orders, policies, extend to every workplace, you know, every, you know, closed situation, particularly schools. Some, you know, we already mentioned about a patchwork, mm -hmm. you know, uh, patchwork si system of school divisions putting, you know, their own uh, policies in place. So we need to do that, you know, from the government. The government mm -hmm. needs to e make sure that rapid tests is scaled up, you know, uh, and rapid tests is one of the tools we need to have in our armamentarium, mm -hmm. you know, Germany, Denmark. Denmark announced three weeks ago that COVID-19 is no longer a social threat. Japan mm. did that last week. You know, mm. wouldn't we want to, we, you know, when would our turn come, you know, mm. where we declare, we declare that COVID-19 is no longer a social threat because we have suppressed it and we have enough capacity, you know, to handle, mm. you know, COVID-19 situation at the low, low level that it is. So I'm not actually kind of uh, wiggling out of this question, except to say that I still don't think lockdown, uh, a whole scale lockdown is what is called for tomorrow. You know, we need to do other things before we think about a lockdown or, or uh, a stay at home order just yet. 
Yeah, thank you so much for that. Pamela, building on that, because we know what the city asked for, and you were declined on that by the province in terms of looking at some further restrictions at the municipal level. Can you speak more to that? Well, I think, um, you know, in emergency management, so emergency management is all about identifying a problem, getting the smart people together and solving the problem and coming up with steps to solve the problem. And, you know, emergency management is all about a level of response. So you think about in a fire department, you know, you might have a second alarm fire or a third alarm fire. And so one of the big things is looking and building indicators and data to make decisions. And we don't want anybody making decisions without the right data and without the right decision points to make those decisions. And that's what we really strive to do at the city of Saskatoon was build a good data model to make decisions on. And then, then it's not a political decision. It's not a um, decision based on public sentiment. It's a decision based on a data model that is built on reputable data, data and built with a thoughtful response in mind. And in any emergency management situation, there's different levels of response. And so we want a corresponding level of response to what the data is telling us. And that was the reason we asked for the gathering restriction is, you know, the data model we built and the data model we looked for expertise on indicated that the level we're at, which is level orange in Saskatoon, um, is a gathering restriction would make a difference. And so that's the reason we went forward with that request. And I think, you know, that that as uh, Dr. Mahaj indicated those those lockdown requests that's an extreme measure and you know you want to look at that impact there and so the idea is an emergency management is first of all you try to mitigate the risk and you mitigate the risk by being vaccinated you mitigate the risk by by putting measures in place and then you respond to the risk in an appropriate manner and so given we're at a level orange right now the appropriate manner for all of the data we received and all the assessments we did with the, with the medical health experts was gathering restrictions would be appropriate right now. And, you know, I think it's really important to note that the request we put forward, you know, um, had the had the um, added bullet that, you know, if if an event or a gathering of facility has proof of vaccination or negative test in place, then the gathering restriction isn't required. It's for those events, it's for those occurrences where you don't have that other mm -hmm. level of control in place. Mm -hmm. and so I think that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a process and response based on data and based on a measured holistic response. Yeah, thank you for that. Dr. Kendall, I know you've been co making comments on this, you know, what's your thoughts on this in terms of kind of the next steps? And I mean, to, to, to be fair, because they you know this was asked by an audience member, like, do we need a lockdown? And, you know, building on what Nazim and Pam were saying is like, we've got to look at some other measures to put in place aside from vaccination. And so what else, what else could you add to this, uh, Dr. Kendall? Well, I think the word lockdown is quite sort of incendiary because it implies, you know, yeah. a massive, uh, you know, stay at home order. Yeah. But I've been hearing uh, more really from people in public health uh, is uh, a call for a circuit breaker, which might be a fairly time limited activity uh, or order to restrain, you know, numbers of people meeting in, in particularly indoors for a period of time. And uh, I think that might be quite appropriate. Uh, I guess one of the things we also need to be mindful of is we, uh, we are, still in a very deep crisis in terms of strain on our healthcare system and on our healthcare workforce. Uh, today, there were 76 patients in ICUs and, uh, you know, that uh, with COVID. And that, that exceeds, you know, the original, the usual customary ICU capacity for the entire province for all conditions. And mm -hmm. so, you know, as Dr. Master has pointed out, you know, we've, we've gone from straining now our absolute surge capacity. So we may need some, some measures to actually uh, curtail that. I just also want to say that the, uh, the implementation of, uh, you know, mandatory vaccine for access to certain places will help. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes you see those pictures of bars, you know, where people are dancing on the floor, literally in each other's mm -hmm. face. And, uh, if we can prevent unvaccinated people from going into those environments, I believe that will help. It's interesting, we're seeing more um, uh, policies just today, you know, the federal government announced, I mean, we'll, we'll need to have vaccination to board aircraft mm -hmm. anywhere in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. And I think those policies will begin to help, but uh, 
as I said earlier, time is often of the essence. And mm -hmm. you can't sit back and, you know, think about this deeply for a long time. You have to act swiftly. So I want to go and thank you for that, Dr. Kendall. So, you know, Jane Morrison, here you are, CAO, president of a whole bunch of different care facilities, including St. Paul's Hospital. I've got my own family members that are working in ICU and emergency care. You know, so so what what are you what are you doing right now in terms of, of how you're navigating in terms of some of those measures? Yeah. Well, and I think in healthcare we've had many measures, and I think the um, state of COVID where we it's been ongoing learning from start mm -hmm. to finish, and so those protocols change sometimes daily, at the very yeah. least weekly. And it's a huge challenge making sure that that information gets out to all the people that it mm -hmm. needs to get out to and to keep people trained up and applying uh, the new information. And I think that's, that's a little bit the part of the um, fatigue that people have and healthcare workers, mm -hmm. some have, is that it seems like things are always changing. And I have to sit back sometimes and think about, you know, yes, I read the newspaper. I'm on the internet looking at information. I go mm -hmm. on the SHA website looking for information. The average Joe isn't searching out those things because they maybe aren't the most important thing in their life. So how do we get information out to people? How do we, how do we teach people how to keep changing and you know, we're so used to having expertise and here's the way you do things and you teach it and it stays and it's stagnant. Nothing about this has been stagnant. It, it's the direction, the advice has been changing. That's really hard for people and even harder for people who aren't the people who might be looking at the same websites and media feeds that I look at. So I'm everyday conscious of how do we get information out to people that people can hear and keep them learning and keep them void and keep them confident as well? As Dr. Masri says in the ICU, you know, frankly, even administrators have, we've hardly been out in the hospitals because we're not, we're not supposed to be in the health settings either. So yeah. how do you keep a workforce void? How do you keep a workforce happy when you're working under such constrained conditions and how do you keep a, a public how do you build their knowledge when they come from a different place than you do yeah thank you so much i want to close this loop on this kind of session of questions because guess what we're getting to the end here so we could go on and i i teased before we became live that we could probably go till midnight and we literally could because the interest just keeps boiling up but i also know that there are people people need to have their time and they need to get some energy but dr Masri, i want you to close the loop here because uh, you know, Jane and others talked about something here called capacity, and you've been you've been sharing that already during the show in terms of what are some of the measures we do with the capacity. So where do we go from here, Dr. Masri, in terms of that capacity issue? What are some of the things that we need to address now? You know, <clears throat> I think it's really, really important to highlight uh, that public health measures work very, very well. Uh, because they impact a lot of people. And, you know, we know that there are many things that can be done. And even before I say that, all along the second wave, third wave, when um, I've had some uh, people, um, you know, and now I have a new new, uh, new fan just join us, a, a cat. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, people sometimes who would like to challenge some of the things that I say on Facebook or social media, they say, well, you all, you're asking for a lockdown. Mm -hmm. And I always say, I, I've never actually on the record ever called for a lockdown mm -hmm. since day one. And most of my colleagues have actually never called for a lockdown. And I don't think anyone needs to advocate for a lockdown because COVID will force our hands to one if we reach the point where only that is the solution. You see, in, in a week from now, if the ICU census continue to increase, it, it, regardless of what Premier Scott Moore wants to do or not do, we will reach a point where that's the only solution. 
But let me give you a parallel example to that. If someone has a foot infection, not a single doctor in his right or her right state of mind would say the treatment to the infected foot is amputation. That's just simply not true. No, nobody would say, you know what, this looks not good. Go ahead and amputate. There's so many things we could do to an infected foot. What we are in is late stage of an infected foot or a pandemic. There's so many things that we could do. What can we do and how we could move forward to, to make sure that our cousins and aunts and loved ones are not on an airplane in a week from now or 10 days from now on the way to Ontario to be cared for by an Ontario ICU and potentially die alone somewhere in Ontario by themselves. So what can we do? There's so many things that we could do. First of all, enforcement of the existing rules. We have a lot of good rules, finally. So masking has to be enforced. Um, we need to immediately, one of the things that really I'm disappointed in is this rule that you either are vaccinated or you have a negative test. We cannot have a negative test option. That has to be removed. Because the negative test in the last 72 hours just means that I was negative 72 hours ago. Do you know what I do in 71 hours after that? And so that option has to go. And we need to make sure that anybody who truly has a reason, and by the way, there are very, very few to almost non-existent reasons not to get the vaccine. And of course, anyone who can't or had a massive reaction, etc. those are cases that are handful and we could deal with them and make sure that we take care of these people. But otherwise, the second thing, other than enforcing our rules, we need to immediately take that option out. Number three, we need to be clear with people. You see, if I told you today, and, I, and again, sorry for my obsession with the weather, but if I told you that the temperature outside is minus 20, many of us would still go out, but we would dress accordingly. We're not saying that lie to the people we we want we think that modeling data and information has to be shared we need to share with people because i think look i honestly and i don't say this to be uh you know adorable with the people watching or the people of saskatchewan i mean it i think people are bright i really really believe people are really really bright that's how i talk to my patients i i don't talk to my patients like you know i am really smart and they don't know what i'm talking about i share with them exactly what they need to hear and I think if we are truthful with people, and I'm specifically directing to this towards Honorable Premier and his health minister, we need to be very truthful. You know, the 200, 300 cases and previous to that 400 cases over the last few days do not reflect the picture. We have a big problem and we're coming to a very special holiday. And the refusal to, to tell people that we are in trouble is going to lead to worsening of the situation. So I don't ever need to call for a lockdown because I promise you the lockdown will call for itself. So I don't need to be on that team. It's a very unpopular team. It will force itself. But we need to immediately enforce our rules, make sure that our vaccination uh, 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 mandates are more broad. So anyone in education, anyone in healthcare, anyone in entertainment, anyone in restaurants, anyone in government has to get it. And by the way, mandate works as, as I mentioned in the previous question, our vaccine rates have doubled, tripled, and quadrupled in one week, some of these weeks. And finally, we really need to move that, um, you know, negative test. I'll say this. And again, it's like, because we keep always saying to people, things are bad, things are bad. People are like, okay, I've heard Masri say that, like only 11 months now. The situation in the ICU is really, really terrible. And it is full of young people. And we need to understand that when a 20 year old, a 30 year old, 40 year old is dying alone in the ICU, there are some serious consequences, consequences to that. And those same people that I'm seeing in the ICU, I would say at least half of them, the first thing that they say to me or the second thing that they say to me when they see me in the ICU is they say, is there any chance I could get the vaccine now? And it really hurts that we could not collectively as a society and especially as a government, because I will always put the responsibility on on the people who could lead policy, why could not I have reached that 25-year-old or 35-year-old and given them that vaccine just a month ago? 
Why didn't I mandate it? Because some people need that mandate, right? I mean, I don't drink and drive. Uh, you know, I try to put my seatbelt all the time, mm -hmm. but I, it's good to know that there is a policy to govern that. And we need to really, really highlight that. I can't say this enough. We are in deep, deep trouble. You know, I, I sense trouble in the, in the hospitals. Honestly, when I enter the hospital, like you could feel trouble. And this is not to scare anyone. This is not to inject any fear. But my message to you is make sure your gatherings this weekend are extremely small. Make sure that they're out as door as possible. And if someone is not vaccinated, you really want to try to avoid that at all costs. And you really want to tell people to go and, and get that vaccine because otherwise this is going to drag for a very long time and there's going to be a really painful human price to all of this. Yeah, thank you so much for those words. I mean, there's a lot of wisdom coming from this panel. So thank you so much for that. Anika, over to you for the last question of the night. Thanks, Lenore. Yeah, so the last question before we go to our closing remarks um, is, what do you think some of the key learnings may be for the healthcare system and beyond emerging from this? And um, whoever wants to start, please go ahead. I can start since uh, I'm still uh, warm <laughs> and I'll make it very brief. I think one of the things that I really think we need to talk about is prevention. And one of the things I've learned personally is that we even though we always think about it, we don't actually talk about it enough um, and we don't make sure our patients hear about it. So many of the many of the people who are critical sometimes of what we say, they say, OK, now you care about prevention. Where is your prevention for uh, other diseases uh, like diabetes and hypertension and, and things like that? And I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned from this is that my advocacy and the advocacy of this panel and other people who are very um, uh, 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 you know, uh, helpful in, in this in this advocacy for COVID and fighting COVID. We need to take that to advocate for uh, people to have access to places where they could exercise. We need to have advocacy for people so they could eat well. I mean, you drive through you know 20th Street and and by going to St. Paul's and you see the results of the negligence that we've done towards. Uh, people who are struggling with mental health and drug addiction, we need to take the advocacy of you know prevention to other diseases because we will have more credibility that way. You know, if I'm talking about prevention, prevention, prevention about COVID, but I'm not as loud in the prevention of other things, uh, then people will start to question my credibility. So I th one of the lessons I've learned is that I really need to be very proactive with my patients, but also with the government, with our fellow citizens about prevention of other things and how I could advocate louder to use my voice to help people um, advocate for prevention of all these other things. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Masri. Um, I'll go to Jean Morrison. Um, I think one of the things that has really um, been a learning, a learning for me or that I've really come to notice is that the impact on families, you know, in healthcare, we've talked for years about client family centered care and including families in the care and how important they are to the well-being of those people we serve. I think COVID and limiting the access to our, our buildings of um, families and loved ones has really, really demonstrated the impact that can have on our clients. And it's really reinforced for me how much we still focus on, on the physical health and well-being of people without looking at the psychosocial well-being and how those two are so tightly tied together. And I hope that as we move out of this, that uh, we are better with those learnings on apply, applying that on a day-to-day -day basis on including families and loved ones in everything we do. I don't think we have always or always do that as well as we might. Thank you, Jean. And um, I'll go to Dr. Nazim next. You know, I, my comment uh, is kind of twofold. Uh, one is uh, kind of from a professional point of view and other kind of personal. Uh, from a professional point of view, I think um, 
one of the things that we have learned is how important public health is in the healthcare system continuum. <laughs> when mm -hmm. we talk about, you know, it, it's wonderful uh, to see everyone who are in the front lines, in the wards, in the theaters, you know, operating theaters, talking about public health and public health prevention. And, you know, we are all on the same team. You know, we, we, we are talking about health, you know, that whole continuum prevention to palliation, really, and everything in between. So I, I, I think that, you know, that is one of the things that we have to remember coming out of this pandemic. Uh, when the urgency is gone, when the urgency is behind us, we still need to remember that public health is important for a well-functioning, thriving society, you know, that we want to create. Not only hospitals, not only you know, clinics, but public mm -hmm. health is important. And uh, and I think I, I, I want to say that. Uh, we, we've been here before and we were here in, in 2003, you know, uh, and, and so on. You know, we've been here before in HIV, we were, the, you know, in 1990s, you know, but we keep learning our lessons about the importance of public health and then promptly forgetting it when that threat, when that urgency passes us. The second thing is personal. You know, um, one of the things that, that this pandemic has taught me is that um, uh, the, the pandemic has affected all of us in multiple dimensions. It has affected me as a professional, but it has also affected me as a, you know, as a father, you know, as a member of the community, and and you know, and a you know, and a and a partner to you know, to to, uh, to my wife, and I think we need to keep that in mind when we are talking about this pandemic. It's not only from a professional point mm -hmm. of view, but mm -hmm. also personal point of view, because everybody else, you know, is also experiencing this pandemic in multiple dimensions. And I, I don't, I think that you know. Uh, it behooves us to keep that in mind, you know, going forward. Thank you, Dr. Nazim. And um, next, I'll go to Dr. Kendall. Well, I concur with uh, everything my uh, health panelists have said. I just want to touch on two different facets. One is, uh, um, I, I think we have learned some valuable lessons through this pandemic about care of the elderly and uh, that we have to look at different ways of uh, optimizing capacity of people to live in their own homes and to support them in the community and resist the urge to warehouse people in you know in four room long-term care facilities which are sort of death traps when you when you get a pandemic so uh, there will need to be rethinking how we uh, how we support aging in a society uh, from a perspective of mitigating risk of, of pandemic harm in the future. The other thing I, you know, there's always some good things that come out of tragedy. And uh, we have learned some valuable lessons, I think, about much community-based care can be provided virtually quite effectively. Now, it's difficult in regions, of course, where there's limited access to virtual tools, but I do think that um, we will gain some benefits out of uh, having learned to uh, provide some primary care services virtually. And that's something we don't want to lose as we, as we go forward. Perfect. And um, last but not least, I'll go to Pamela. Got to make sure I find that mute button. Um, I'm going to take it a different angle than from the healthcare because you have experts on healthcare here. That's not me. Um, I think two things. The first is I would really like for us to think about different terminology than the pandemic of the unvaccinated right now. Because the unvaccinated to me are number one, the under 12s who can't be vaccinated. But more importantly, those living in poverty, those who are marginalized in our society. And what we've learned in any disaster situation, and we are in a disaster, is that in any disaster situation, those who are living in poverty, those who are marginalized, those who are disadvantaged are always disproportionately impacted by this. And I think it is very simple for me to sit here in judgment of people who aren't vaccinated yet. But I know that there are many in our community who are striving to find something to eat or a place to sleep 
or are struggling with addiction where vaccination is just not within their their ability or within their sphere. And I think the SHA has done a phenomenal job of trying of outreach with vaccination and they have gone to many locations and they have made an effort to really connect where people are at. And, you know, I, I've shared the term, you know, being an old social worker, the term is you go, you start where the client's at. And so I think that's something we really have to consider is how do we start where the client's at and how do we, you know, help those people who are most disproportionately, you know, impacted by this. Cause I think, again, my son had COVID at the start of the pandemic and it was very simple for our family to self-isolate. We live in a nice big house. We all have our own bathrooms. We all have, you know, own bedrooms. We have access to food. We have a tremendous family and community support, not a challenge, but there are many people who this is an incredible challenge for. And so I think we just have to, to take a look at how we're treating everyone in our society at this point and be very reflective of that. The other thing that disaster research has told us is that, you know, I think there's expectations that when there's a major disaster, like a hurricane, like a tornado, people panic and people run around and they just look out for themselves. And disaster research has shown that's inaccurate. When those events happen, people pull together as a community. They look out for each other. They support each other. And that's what we're asking people to do today is support each other by wearing your mask, by being vaccinated. All of these things are things that we've learned in other disasters that we have to now put into the disaster we're facing with this pandemic. Thank you so much, Pamela. And over to you, Lenore, for a closing yeah. remark. Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, we, we, we have been going in rounds now for a while and I really, really appreciate it. But I do want to give, you know, a last kind of comment to you on and, and let's go on a positive note here. What's a positive message that we want to share uh, with our viewing audience as we kind of move forward with us into Thanksgiving and, and I'll begin by saying I'm very thankful and feel much gratitude for all of you and for all of the efforts that each of you do in terms of sharing good public community education based in evidence for us to be able to help uh, us as citizens um, of our community do the best that we can. So just much appreciation and gratitude and thank you as we head into Thanksgiving Day this weekend. Um, Dr. Masri, lead us off, please. I have two quick notes. The first one is very personal. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 on a very positive note, I've never admitted this publicly, but I have to admit that um, it is such an honor to be on a panel with everyone, but specifically Dr. Dennis uh, Kendall, who I, as a young physician, I look up to his advocacy. I, he's exactly what I wish to be. Um, and his voice is always kind, is always loud, is always firm, is unwavering, is scientific. And I think it's really important for young physicians like me to have mentors like him. And I can't say enough how much I admire and respect Dr. Kendall. The second one uh, is I cannot also express enough how wonderful the business community in Saskatoon has been. On Instagram, I follow many, many of these businesses. They have been very instructive on the fact that they will be enforcing these rules, but they are so kind in the way they deliver, and there's something to learn from them. They're, they're, they're welcoming everyone, but they're still encouraging people to get their vaccine. And I think that the majority of business owners have sacrificed an incredible amount of money and time and partake over this pandemic. And to be this kind and helpful and supportive uh, till today means the world to us in healthcare. So I take my hats off to uh, every business owner in Saskatoon for being such wonderful helpers in our city and great allies. Um, and uh, and thank you for having me on a panel uh, right directly under Dr. Kendall. So I, I'm I'm really happy. <laughs> He's right above me, and I uh, and I could I I, I and. Uh, and there's a lot to learn. We, we really need to learn from all these. And, and again, not to take anything from anybody on the panel, but there's so much to learn from uh, from him uh, beyond the medicine. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Mazur. And I, I got to put in a little note of thanks too for your stash now evolving into uh, a full facial beard there because we've been having a lot of fun with that through these panels. So looking good as we go into, guess what, Movember. <laughs> so there you go. So I want to toss it over to Pamela as we kind of head into the Thanksgiving weekend. Well, I also want to start with a personal note and thank my family. Um, I'm in a, in a business mm -hmm. where they're used to me 
you know, getting a call and having to leave very quickly, but I've gotten a call 18 months ago and have not been as connected to them as mm -hmm. I would like to be. And we've had moments of time together, but I think like a lot of the people involved in this response, those moments haven't been what they used to be. And so I want to thank them for their patience and their kindness with me. The other thing I'm thankful for is um, in the last 18 months, we've built different relationships in Saskatoon. And, you know, in emergency management, we always talk about your emergency go kit. And, you know, in your emergency go kit, you need some water and you need a, um, you know, you need a bottle opener, you need a can opener, you need some food. But I think more and more, before you even need those things, before you even need water, you need relationships and you need friendships and you need a community together. And so getting to know your neighbors, getting to know your community so you can help each other out. And that's really what we've been doing in the last 18 months. Um, I've worked closely with health in the past, but I've never had the type of relationships I've had with our health partners mm -hmm. and emergency managers that we've had throughout this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we've all done is we've all bolstered our emergency response kit and our emergency go bag with those relationships. And I know for emergency management, that's gonna be one of my focuses is who are we forgetting? Who haven't we talked to? And who do we need to share this with? And so who are we having those conversations with? And that's what I'm thankful for, is we are having these conversations. We are building these partnerships. We are building these relationships. Mm -hmm. And this will sustain us long term, no matter what other type of emergencies we might face in Saskatoon. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Pamela. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Dr. Nazim, as we call you now, um, over to you. Uh, you know, when, 30 years ago, almost 31 years, uh, when we came to Saskatoon uh, from Massachusetts, uh, Catherine and I, uh, we didn't know what kind of a place we were coming to. I mean, I wasn't born in North America and um, I, I came here uh, via Massachusetts, uh, before that Ohio and so on. Um, what I'm thankful for is the diversity that we have in this city, in this province, and in this uh, in this country of Canada, um, and that diversity of people, of cultures, people from different backgrounds, working together uh, to bring all of us out of this pandemic in a good way, uh, has been inspiring really uh, and has been a, a, a kind of a testament to humanity you know what a diverse community and a culture and a country can achieve you know if we work together and uh, and that i'm very very thankful for and uh, i think i made the one of the best decisions in my life when i came here 30 years ago um, the other uh, thing that i'm thankful for is that um, we have to be open to talking with people. I think Pamela mentioned relationship. Mm -hmm. Without relationships, with we are nothing. Mm -hmm. We are absolutely nothing. And uh, relationships with our, not only with our family, but being able to actually pick up the phone and talk to someone mm -hmm. in Alberta who is vaccine hesitant, but have questions about vaccine hesitancy and about vaccines. And just being able to have a normal conversation, you know, being open to that and, and from both sides. <laughs> from both sides, been open to that, have a civil civil conversation, you know, uh, within and without antipathy, you know, I'm really thankful for that. And I think I would I would urge people to be open, open minded, give the benefit of the doubt to the person that you're talking with, even though they might seem to not agree with you. Give the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. They think, feel, and you know, the same way as you are, have the same needs. And and there are a lot of common places that you can meet with them, you know, uh, and I think that is what we need to build on. Uh, and I want to leave uh, uh, with that comment. There are a lot of common things that we can build on and as humans. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Nazim, much appreciation. Jean Morrison, over to you. Yeah, and I just um, want to wave off a little bit and I think of all the people that work in the service sector in restaurants and stores and in bars and and in healthcare. And I grew up in a store environment and very seldom did I ever deal with people who were frustrated and angry, you know, day after day. And I watch some of these folks and frankly, the the calmness and professionalism that they're showing when really bad day and I thank them for showing the best of 
our community and the best of humanity in dealing with those people. When someone is really emotional and upset, you know, to have a really strong and healthy society, we have to help each other. And frankly, I make sure now that, you know, I used to mind my own business. I make sure now to thank those young waiters, wait, waitresses, people in stores when they had to deal with something that was really tough. I make a point of going and thanking them for their professionalism because they need to hear that. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Really, really appreciate it. Dr. Kendall, last word from the panel. Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Massery for his very kind words. Uh, even my uh, deceased mother was never quite so glowingly uh, <laughs> complimentary to me. Uh, this is a uh, time for Thanksgiving. And uh, I am thankful actually for having grown up in a rural community where I learned a lot of values about caring for your neighbor, um, quite sacrificially, you know, the quintessential story of when, you know, a farmer would fall ill during harvest. We would come together and take that person's crop off before we did our own. And, and that's something that I still hope we maintain in our society that we look out for each other, that we uh, care for each other. Um, I have great support from my family, but I also want to acknowledge that I'm part of a, a, a spiritual community through a congregation. And uh, one of the things that has been quite uh, difficult during this time is to help people through the grieving process. Uh, many elderly people are in congregation, people have died for various reasons, and uh, it was so hard during the time that you couldn't actually, you know, even come close to each other, because we want to hug each other, we want to comfort one another, and I guess we've learned somewhat how to actually support people through grieving, and uh, now we often belatedly do uh, events where people come together maybe a year after the event, now that we have a little bit more freedom to do so. And uh, I'm thankful we've been able to have that close social network with, with a wonderful group of people. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Anika, last word from our team. Perfect, thank you, Lenore. And thank you everyone for joining today. Much appreciation panel members for taking the time out to be here. Again, I know you're all very busy. And um, thanks to the audience members for tuning in for great questions. And we do apologize for not taking all the questions. We definitely, we always run out of time, but we'll be, um, we'll make sure that we address all the questions in no YXC page. And um, thanks to my colleagues, Lenore, Ian, and Deb. We shall continue to con conduct forums like this. So make sure to like our Facebook page, The Voice of Saskatoon. Specifically speaking, and no Saskatoon, where we'll be conducting shows on various topics throughout the coming months. So, Lenore, are you ready to say this with me? <laughs> you betcha. What are we saying here? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> so, let's wash our hands, wear a mask, be sure to get back if you're not, <laughs> and stay apart so we can be together in person sooner than later. There you Thanks go. Thanks for watching, everyone. <laughs> Dr. Thanks, Kendall. Thanks, Dr. Kendall. Thanks, everyone. Take care, everyone.